Welcome to this edition of More Than Velocity Podcast. I'm Ryan Croton. I'm going to be the host today. Bart Pear is out. He's got some daddy duty going on. I'm going to keep Jordan Osegura in check. I know he can get a little off topic at times, so I'm going to take the command and reins. But we got a special guest for today's podcast, uh, somebody I truly admire in the field of sport performance. Uh, it's Chris Bishop. He is the uh, senior lecturer in strength and conditioning at the London Institute of Sport at Middlesex University. He oversees graduate school students. And this guy has published 150 peer reviewed journal articles. And for those of you who are academics, you know the deal. But for those of you who don't, that's like getting your head kicked in three times that. Um, you know, trying to publish these papers and getting them kicked back to you. And, you know, he's got 150 of these babies. Uh, accepted, which is incredible. Um, I don't know anybody who's, you know, under the age of 50 that you know, does work like that. So he's amazing. He's, he studies lower body performance, primarily in uh, interlimb asymmetry and jump tests. He is the authority, in my opinion, on jump tests in the world. Uh, I've read tons of his work, and I am just so grateful to have him on the uh, podcast. And uh, Chris, man, I want to turn it over to you and kind of talk a little bit about your experiences in terms of where you got to today and, uh, you know, some of the, the new research that you're working on before we get into the nitty gritty. Yeah, crikey, what an introduction that was. Thank you very much. <laughs> Super grateful. Um, okay, so yeah, I'm, uh, I'm based in London in the UK. Um, I've been kind of uh, focused on primarily delivering the postgraduate program for about the last six years there. Um, a colleague of mine and myself are starting to build quite a nice big PhD program at Middlesex as well. So we've got other kind of graduate students away from the master's program um, trying to get their doctorates, which is nice. So we've got this nice big um, practitioner focused postgraduate degree and this more research based setting in PhD students. Um, so we're kind of ticking you know, we're wearing multiple hats, so to speak. Um, I guess in terms of my background, well, I guess if we go back to um, something like 2004, 2000, yeah, about 2004, I'll give you a real whirlwind tour. I just started off as a personal trainer. Um, mm -hmm. And then I did that for about three years. And then I got my first gig in professional sport as a consultant where I um, I was a strength and conditioning coach in professional football, although you guys would call that soccer. Um, I did a, about two and a half years there. The club actually went into administration, um, which means my services got cut. And then after that, I went to work for a, quite a, a sizable private healthcare company where my role was to head up the performance side of the business. And I did that till about 2013. Um, from about 2000, the end of 2008 to 2013. And so, uh, and that was one of the best experiences of my life, to be truthful with you, because, you know, I was kind of out there in the private sector, just at the sub elite level of sport, trying to hustle for contracts. And what most people in strength and conditioning, particularly in the UK, certainly 10 years ago anyway, you know, no one taught you business skills. So to go out and, you know, have to win contracts, get rejected, get rejected, get rejected, finally get a small one, reflect, learn some lessons. And then after a couple of years, you know, I, I got a couple of probably about two sizable contracts, uh, one mediocre one, and then, and then about three small ones. Um, and it was certainly enough to kind of, you know, justify my position within the company, um, you know, keep my salary going the way we need it to. So I got to work with some, some very, very good athletes, particularly at the youth level, predominantly in swimming, tennis and track and field. When I was working in the private sector, my most successful athletes were definitely in swimming um, and were definitely competing, um, almost all of them at national level and a handful of them at international level. So that was really, really nice to kind of recruit a contract at the sub elite level get some consistency over a period of time with these people and really watch them grow and develop and be part of their journey. That was lovely. And then I guess halfway through that in 2011, um, I did my master's degree in strength and conditioning, which I actually studied at where I'm working now. And then um, they invited me in the following year to do a bit of part-time teaching. Um, and I did my master's when I was 29, right? So 
Um, I wasn't straight out of undergrad. I wasn't too wet behind the ears, uh, <laughs> although probably still a little bit. And uh, and I did a bit of part-time teaching in 2012. And then from 2013 onwards, I took a post at Middlesex, where I am now, um, as a lecturer in strength and conditioning. And then I just was doing that on the undergrad program for about three years. And then I've worked up to take over the master's degree um, ever since then. From a kind of practitioner perspective, whilst I've still been um, sort of working as an academic ever since 2013, done a number of different roles really, lots of consultancy and professional soccer over here, some of which was part of my PhD over the last four years. Um, and then the last couple of years, I've also been working quite closely with the NFL who set up an academy here in London with the goal of um, trying to find, I guess, the next the next generation of talent outside of the US is probably, that, that feeds into the NCAA system, it is probably the, the sort of sweeping bottom line up front about what the mission is for that thing. Um, and that's been really quite eye-opening, you know, different experience, particularly for someone who's English, who doesn't have loads of experience working in American football. Um, so that's been really, really good. Um, and then I guess the third kind of part of the story, if you like, is the, um, you know, the research side of things. I tried to embed myself very heavily in that in the past five years, uh, five or six years, really, actually, particularly while I was doing my PhD. And I guess, <clears throat> you know, one of the questions I get asked is, oh, why did you do asymmetry for your PhD? And I guess I sort of naturally fell into that line of investigation because, Prior to being at Middlesex, I worked for a big healthcare company, like I mentioned. So I was always working closely with therapists and physiotherapists. And so I guess a lot of my interest ever since I started working there in 2009 was always almost at the remedial end of strength and conditioning, if you like. So that's kind of, you know, where, you know, working closely with physios and people like that, you naturally fall into that line, you know, the, trying to bridge that gap between performance and rehab kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So I, the, um, the focus on asymmetry, imbalances, correction, et cetera, um, probably naturally stemmed from there, really, which is where a, a lot of my research um, has kind of been over the last few years, really. And that probably brings you just about up to speed. That's amazing. Yeah. So, you know, you, you kind of touched on some things that uh, had kind of been swirling in my mind and in my experience in sport performance as well as, you know, and, and I want to talk about, you know, this, this kind of concept of athleticism and health. If you're a better athlete, I, you know, I, in my mind, intuitively, if you're a better athlete, does that mean that you have lower asymmetries? Does it mean that you're healthier? That's that's always been a burning question for me. If we're making athletes better, more elastic, they are able to produce appropriate stiffness, you know, um, to develop power when they sprint or when they jump. You know, are we are we making them healthier, or could they, or is there completely separate worlds there? Yeah, I mean, I think the key thing you said at the beginning there. And I use this word a lot in my research papers, actually, is intuitively. You know, you, you naturally think the word imbalance and we kind of historically and traditionally and intuitively think hmm, maybe I should do something to correct that. You know, maybe I should try and even it out. Uh, maybe that will make my athlete better if I if I sort that out, you know. Um, and I certainly went into my PhD with that line of thought as well, you know, five or six years ago. Um, but it, it's definitely not that simple. Um, I, I guess the, I jump to the end almost, you know, the answer to that question is probably that asymmetry is so task specific and it's variable. It's quite noisy as a concept. And part of that is because it's a ratio number, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and I'm gonna talk about that a, a little bit later on, I'm sure as well. Um, so a ratio being, you know, it's made up of two different component parts and actually, you know, in sports science and strength and conditioning, we deal with ratios all the time as practitioners and, and often overlook them, you know, like a, a ratio is something that's made up of two, sometimes three parts. Actually, if you talk about the bilateral deficit, which is not the same as asymmetry, um, and you, you then treat it as one number, but <clears throat> remember every time we measure something, it has error to it. Yeah. And when someone has error, and then you have 
one thing that is made up of two parts, you compound the error when you make it one. And when yeah. you compound error, you make something noisier. And that's the same for almost all ratios, you know, yeah. like bilateral deficit, RSI, you know, and I'm going to go, I'm going to go on a bit. DSI. R yeah. DSI, RFD, impulse. Like yeah. The world's obsessed with impulse and jumping. Yes. Right? This is a ratio, you know, yeah. um, you know, so and hamstring quadricep set, uh, traditional hamstring quad ratios, you know, on dynamometry. That's a ratio, you know, it's all these things that we often use and often treat one number without sometimes looking at the component parts. And I think that um, what I found with asymmetry, to go back to your original question, is it's often incredibly noisy and the noise often masks um, any linear association or relationship with another stable metric that you might think is there often, you know, like if you have a really stable metric, like sprint speed or something like that, like how fast you run, you know, if you calculate the error for each subject in a group of athletes, you usually end up with really good, absolute reliability, you know, CV values less than 5% easy. Um, and that's because it's generally, assuming the athletes are warmed up properly and they're trying their hardest in the sprint tests, <laughs> usually a really stable metric. Um, and when you try and look at an association between a stable metric and another metric that does this, it's you often don't find much, you know? Yeah. Because, you know, when you look at a relationship or an association, you're kind of just looking at the gradient of the trend line, you know, yeah. on that that graph where you're plotting coordinates of asymmetry on this axis and sprint speed on this axis or whatever. And, you know, when you got one metric that's super stable and one that is just off the chart, like erratic, mm -hmm. um, it becomes really hard to get a trend line that gives you anything, you know? So the predictability and usability of, um, to answer your question, asymmetry it's quite challenging. We think we found some ways of, of doing it, which we might talk a little bit more about later. Um, but that kind of blanket bomb um, link between asymmetry and injury or asymmetry and performance, it's quite, um, it's quite difficult to, you know, it's quite difficult to, I think, suggest that that's really, really strong. And, and as is the case with science, you know, um, I've published loads of papers that have shown a really strong correlation between asymmetry and performance, but I could gather that data again, two weeks later, run the relationship again, and there's no link, you know, and that's because asymmetry is that variable and that noisy. And it's probably the same with, um, you know, asymmetry and injury risk. Again, I'm probably sure to talk a bit more about that later on. I just think one of the problems with, a lot of the research and I have absolutely zero problem holding my hand up and say I'm totally guilty of this in the past is you know when we run associative analysis or odds ratios or relative risk ratios for injury and things like that it's often done at sporadic or single time points and there isn't enough associative analysis uh, or correlational analysis over repeated time points you know because with correlational analysis you can't infer cause and effect because it's not right. a training intervention, right? right. Everyone knows that. Um, so what makes anyone think, in my opinion, that if I take data at time point X and I run a correlation between two variables and the correlation is 0 0.7, what makes me think that if I run that data again in a month's time, correlation is going to be 0 0.7 again? Because movement variability in athletes is really really high mm -hmm. okay. um and it's very rare for us to have really really truly homogenous samples the most homogenous sample i could think of would be you know the fastest sprinters in the world who all yep. have the ability you know like there's probably i don't know 30 or 40 of them that have the ability to run under 10 seconds you know that's a homogenous sample but you know in professional football even in the premier league like those samples aren't really that homogenous. You can check the scores and you can look at the standard deviation, you know, relative to the mean um, and start doing ranking systems amongst your squad and look at the difference between the fastest and the slowest or who jumps the highest, who jumps the least highest. 
there's large variability even in like premier league soccer players who's supposed to be the best soccer players in the world you know so i think that naturally causes problems when you're looking at associative analysis because you shouldn't necessarily expect the same results to occur if your sample is akin to lots of variability and you know rank swapping almost if you like within their scores if that makes sense yeah, yeah, yeah I, think, so I think to kind of put that into a baseball here. lens is you know oftentimes we take this information this performance data measure and we try to predict who's going to be our best player or who's going to be the, the draft pick we should go with or who should we give that college scholarship to and we need to understand there's this this uh spectrum of skill and talent and they're both very far from each other and you have guys that can perform at an extremely high level in the sport of baseball that are extremely skilled and they're moderate maybe low on on the actual god-given talents that they have and then you have other guys that are really talented that they've always been good but their skill's not that great but they can still perform and then somewhere in the middle, you have those guys that have both skill and talent, and those are the ones that play for a really long time. And those come in all shapes, all sizes. Uh, some of them are built like me, which is the ideal standard is what Ryan always points out, you know. <laughs> um, and, you know, it's, it's just I think that kind of helps wrap it around. I know uh, I, I like to pull things from as many different sports as you can because that keeps a fresh perspective on things because it allows you to see things outside of the frame of the picture you're standing in. Uh, but I did want to try to point that into, you know, a lot of our audience is baseball. Uh, and I wanted to try to see if, yeah. if I'm, if I'm understanding that right from a baseball lens, uh, if you, if you don't mind, give me some feedback on that. I mean, yeah. I, so, sorry, Chris, I, I want to build on that okay. because, because uh, you're, you're right. How do you, you know, build on that? I set the it, foundation and put up the structure, man. That's yeah, fantastic. The, the asymmetries. And I'm going to ask you some more questions just, just to kind of where you, you get to things. Cause we're, we're talking about, you know, a lot of physiologic asymmetries. We're talking about, um, you know, looking at differences in power and forces and things with high technology. But um, Jordan, I want you to go through a visual asymmetry in, in pitchers. And, and the one thing that you have taught me, which I thought is very interesting, I think is from your, your days of working with Tom House, is the equal and opposite connection. That was the first time, uh, and Chris, this will be new for you, this is the first time that I had been aware of actually looking at shapes of pitchers at different instances at different discrete points visually in video that you can even see in still shots. It's very easy to see. So Jordan, I kind of want to walk through that and kind of how, how some of those asymmetries play into performance, you know, in future health, maybe from your experience. So if you don't mind breaking that, because there was a lot that went on there yeah. and I want to make sure that I'm not like trying to answer five things at once. Yeah. So yeah. I know so you for, just explained yeah, a lot. For, you don't yeah. mind going back on just, that. I, I, at the beginning, just let, let's just kind of talk about that equal and opposite concept. Let's just start there. Yeah. So from, from the NPA standard of when you're talking equal and opposite, they're talking about what the throwing arm does. You want that glove arm to mirror. And I still kind of find that to be, to be pretty true in a lot of instances, especially with younger athletes, um, that it's almost like if you're walking on a tightrope is if you have one arm tight, one arm long, you're going to fall off that tightrope to that short side. So you want to be able to have those equal in mirror. And again, you'll hear me talk about it. There's a lot of people that are going to disagree throwing arm. I don't like touching the throwing arm unless it's a last resort. So I always like to adjust the glove side. When you get those things lined up, you are going to throw in general more strikes. You're going to have a little more consistency in your command and your control. But from the physical side of it, not just the biomechanics side, you also want that parity between front side and back side. So accelerators and decelerators. And in baseball, what we've seen is the harder you throw, the more important balance becomes. If you're a guy like me who, you know, grunt, snort, spit, snot coming out of your mouth, you're not able to break a pane of glass, probably don't need to be too worried about what your, your, your ERI or balance is when it comes down to it. But those symmetries start really getting important. Uh, for, the, for the glove side versus non-glove side, we need more information on that, right, Ryan? I don't know that there's a lot of information between throwing and non-throwing side. For sprinters, for the hamstrings, that's pretty important from what I understand, right? Right leg versus left leg. I would, I would think so. That's a Chris question. 
from an um, asymmetry perspective in sprinting. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, um, okay. So um, I'll answer that. I'm going to go back to your query about like your agonist antagonist mm -hmm. when you're throwing, like couldn't agree more, you know, like there's research actually, I think it's even from Kramer, you know, the guy who used to be the editor in chief at journal of strength and condition research. I think he basically showed that um, if your antagonists are stronger, um, you know, bearing in mind, like, throwing a baseball is a perfect example because when you throw and release your antagonists are now working eccentrically and if they don't have any strength to them they have to uh you know put the brakes on earlier right so that your shoulder doesn't pop out of its socket really yeah. crude example, obviously right yeah. crude example but the stronger they are the harder you can throw the ball and your decelerators, which will be your, you know, like your rhomboids, your mid traps, your posterior delt, things like that. They can just turn around and they can say, throw it as hard as you want. Don't worry. I've got this, you know, that's, you know, without your shoulder kind of like coming out of its socket kind of thing. Um, and not only does that enable you actually to throw faster potentially, which I think is what Kramer said. And also, we've seen a lot of on our accuracy. end, you increase that, you throw harder. Yeah. Already throw hard. Yeah. No, 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 you're absolutely right. You throw harder, but it probably also helps you, um, you know, potentially with things like accuracy as well, you know? So I think that's, I completely agree with you on that. Um, this, just to go back to your query, when you said it's a Chris question, um, there's very little actually on asymmetry um, and how lower limb asymmetry impacts how far she run. Um, I think there's been three papers on it. Um, and interestingly, um, all three have said that it doesn't matter how imbalanced you are, doesn't slow you down. Mm -hmm. I'm talking from a health standpoint, health. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. I, this is how we now see asymmetry. I think if I sort of almost fast forward to the end of my PhD and I start, if I go to like the conclusion chapter of my thesis, almost yeah. give you some of the take home messages. One of the ones is, um, I see asymmetry now as, you know, when you have a 10% imbalance and this leg is stronger than this leg or whatever, you know, whatever metric or test we're talking about, I'm not convinced that 10% is the problem mm -hmm. anymore. I am more convinced that, uh, in fact, actually my PhD showed a lot of the time that if this is 10% and this is my right leg, the next time I test the athletes, this is often 5% and the left leg's now taken over. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so actually you get, we would call that fluctuations in yeah. performance variability. And also remember as well, what that means is if you only monitor the magnitude of asymmetry, that raw percentage value, this is, I'm now monitoring the ratio as one number without the component parts, you get 10%. And then the next time you measured it was 5%. You intuitively, Ryan, you look at that and you go, oh, asymmetry has dropped by 5%. I'm heading in the right direction. But actually, a 5% reduction is meaningless unless you know if the raw scores have increased, yes. if their capacity gone up. Also, is a 5% drop more important or less important than a 15% shift? Because that's what's happened. Yeah, when the, when the, <laughs> the direction of the imbalance is changed. Right. Right. And that's that's one of the things that my PhD focused on the most, which I think we might have been one of the first to do it. We, we weren't the first to talk about it, but we might have been one of the first in healthy athletes to analyze through something called Kappa coefficients, which sounds like a really complex stats thing, but you can do it in Excel. Um, and I've done a video to show people how to do it on YouTube. And it's basically just looking at if I jump higher on my right leg in test session one, you know, do I also jump higher on my right leg the next time I test it or as I switch sides? And you're, it's, you're kind of looking at levels of agreement in limb dominance is what yeah. it is. Basically. So you take the percentage value of asymmetry, the magnitude of asymmetry, and you look at how does that change over time? But you also need to be able to contextualize whether the left or the right or the injured, non-injured or the dominant, non-dominant limb, or in this case, throwing or pitching, non-pitching arm, or, you know, or whatever it is we're talking about, you need to be able to contextualize which one is performing superiorly because asymmetry is a percentage that creates one number out of two contexts. Yeah. So the direction of asymmetry that we, that's what we call it, um, or the direction of the imbalance 
it, it is almost just as important. Um, and I'd say actually potentially in healthy athletes, it's even more important. And here's why. And this is where I now actually answer your question. <laughs> um, and that's because um, it's probably not the athletes who flip flop in the direction of imbalance that you need to worry about. It's the ones that show this limb is constantly outperforming this limb. Yeah. If you have a consistent asymmetry that always favors the same side, I still don't necessarily think the 10% is the problem. I think actually, um, and again, intuitively, it's just that this limb needs to improve its capacity. Right. And that, that hammers out perfect for what, what Ryan was asking. Cause I was about to get, I was trying to work from the shoulders. We'll start at the arms and what he was talking about for equal and opposite, go to the shoulders. And then I wanted to kind of talk about the core. And one of the things we found, and I think that's a perfect segue into that is we started testing core rotational with, with swinging bats. And and what we found the guys who pitchers hitters. Um, one of our first guys we actually put on there was actually Jose Rojas. And he went from being like a singles doubles hitter to got him on the bat speed program, started being a, a doubles home run guy, got drafted, and he obviously got to the big leagues this year for someone who was like a 37th rounder, I think. So <laughs> pretty cool story, but we saw a lot of velocity yeah. improvement through that as well. But the one really interesting thing we found is exactly what you just said. It wasn't necessarily the imbalance swinging right-handed versus left-handed with different weights and all these other things, but what it was is the guys who were consistently imbalanced. Because you might have a one guy, you know, swing X and then swing half X. And then a week later you test and those numbers are flipped. But yep. the guy who was constantly always half X or three quarters X on the non-dominant side, those were the ones getting the oblique strains. Those were the yep. ones, yep. you know, showing volatile throwing velocities. Those were the ones who had that consistent imbalance that were always injured as well as they were not performing consistently. So if you have anything to go more in depth on that, because that was just something that we noticed and you're going to be able to put a lot more smart words into it than I am. <laughs> yeah. I don't know about that. Um, but yeah, no, it's good to, it's good to hear. I, I think it just comes down to um, our viewpoint on it. And, you know, the last five years we've been explaining this to like professional soccer players here in the UK that we do all these collaborations with in research. It's almost just that, <clears throat> If I can produce, uh, you know, I don't know, it's, you're talking about um, core rotational bat swings and stuff like that. The principle of what I'm about to describe still applies to what you just said, even though my example is to do with soccer players, right? Um, it, if I produce a thousand newtons of force on this leg in an isometric strength test, and this leg produces 800 newtons of force, there's my 20% imbalance. But again, forget that this is 20% gap. Just think if I go into a match and I now have to man mark Ronaldo and he's running rings around me and I have to do way more changes of direction, stop starting, decelerating, eccentric loading than I'm used to, this leg will breach its tolerance capacity way earlier than this leg. And that's kind of our... That's our justification, if you like, for why. In, in real quick, you say tolerance capacity. What I interpret that as is the amount of stress or force that that limb or joint is able to handle. I just want to exactly. make sure that everyone understands who's listening what tolerance capacity is. Yeah, sorry. Exactly right. Yeah, just its ability okay. to tolerate stress or load. Yeah, I wasn't um, asking that question for me. I totally understood it. I was asking <laughs> for someone else. <laughs> yeah <laughs> no worries. um but yeah that's exactly it you know if it if it's going to hit its ceiling for what it can handle earlier than this leg then you know when you take it out of its comfort zone which again to use this example in a sport like soccer is so highly possible because there's so many uncontrollable factors right like your opponents yeah you don't know what they're going to do and all that sort of stuff there's too many variables you can't control in team sport athletes it means that if you hit its ceiling for what it can handle then it's going to get injured uh, and breach its tolerance uh, to use that phrase again earlier than the other leg is so it's not that the 20 percent is the problem it's if we can improve its capacity, it can handle more stress and strain and load and just step away from any hypothetical paradigm about injury for a second and just think, 
when we're talking about capacity, whether it's strength, jumping, how fast you move, velocity of movement, nothing bad comes from giving an athlete greater capacity ability. Mm -hmm. Nothing bad happens from that, right? All, the, all you do is you make an athlete more robust. Frank so matters most, man. That's our message. Yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. So that's kind of our, our sort of standpoint really on um, asymmetry and injury. And, you know, there's been a few studies that have tried to like predict this stuff. Um, and, and just, again, step away from the research, think about it a bit more logically and, you know, just from a, a sensible perspective. Injury is so multifactorial, yeah. you know, and how can any one factor be a huge, huge issue on its own, particularly when that factor is a noisy metric and it's a really variable metric? It, it, it can't be. You know, there's, a, there's one paper, I feel really bad because I say this all the time on podcasts and presentations. There's a paper in the British Journal of Sports Medicine in 2016 by an author called Critsis, some I think it's European, um, and it's cited. It's been cited like something like six hundred times in six years, like a hundred times a year. This paper has been cited, <laughs> and basically what it says is that if these professional soccer players didn't hit this test battery before going back to um, get signed off after an ACL, they were four times more likely to get injured, and that test battery includes you needed to have less than 10% asymmetry at 60 degrees per second on isokinetic dynamometry for the quadriceps. You need to have less than 10% asymmetry for the single leg hop, triple hop and crossover hop for distance. You needed to have done an on-field uh, sport specific rehabilitation, which conceptually I think is really good by the way. And then randomly, like you have to have run less than 11 seconds on an agility T test. But what they fail to report is that who says that's the right test battery for starters? Mm -hmm. um, and when you, they had to group those six tests together to determine that, you know, you were four times more likely to injure ACL. And we've already said, who says that's the right test battery, particularly for my athletes, whether it's my sport or even in the same sport. But more importantly, no single test had any predictive capability whatsoever. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's the bit that is often missed from that paper because they gave it like a really sexy title, um, you know, when they published it. And, and, and it's like, you know, it's a noisy concept. Like how could it be a really terrible factor for injury risk on its own? I just don't see how it could be on its own. It's, you know, you speak to Matt Jordan about this stuff. He does a lot on asymmetry and we start working together quite a lot recently. And it's just, another factor in the toolbox for practitioners that we maybe just need to be mindful of assuming we need you know we know how to interpret it huh. so yeah, this this leads into a question i have and you mentioned something kind of when you're introducing yourself on bridging the gap between performance and rehabilitation i think was the, the phrasing you yeah. used i want to yeah. make sure I, I explain that right um yeah. one of the things i've noticed is what what you just to me explained right there I think is a good intro to that. And in baseball, I've noticed that there's this very siloed approach to, well, you're an athletic trainer, so don't even look at the weight room. And you're a strength trainer, don't even look at an athletic trainer. And you're a pitching coach, so just sit in the corner and drink coffee, which I'm fine with, by the way. Uh, but, you know, it's one of those things that it, it's very siloed off. And I've had the chance to speak to, you know, rugby coaches, cricket coaches, researchers like yourself. And it seems like specifically in other countries, in other sports, it doesn't seem to be as siloed. Is that just something I'm misinterpreting? Or what do you think the reason for that is if there is less silo? Because it's like, hey, if you have any input on why this player's shoulder hurts, let us know because we need him back on the field, specifically in rugby and in cricket. But then you go and talk to a, a baseball team and they go, hey, does anyone have any insights on why this player's shoulder hurts? And everyone's like, well, I don't want to hear about it from the nutritionist. It can't be a nutrition problem. Well, I don't want to hear about it from the pitching coach because it can't be that he slipped during PFPs and landed on his, on his shoulder. And that's why he had a slight dislocation. I don't want to hear about that. I just want to hear about what the athletic trainer has to say or why is this player's strength down? Yeah. Well, maybe there is an asymmetry going on that the AT can give a 
give some good feedback on, or maybe there's something going on neurologically. It's like, no, I just only want to hear from the strength coach on this. So, and that's, and that's honestly who gets fired when an injury yes, happens the, to somebody the, like that, you know, a higher end and, athlete. Yeah, and and I know fault. this it's is a long buildup. This is a long buildup, but <laughs> you know, you, you were mentioning some things that like, I've been, I've been taking a, a good chunk of notes here on some things just on hearing you talk. Um, and what stood out is like bridging the gap between performance and rehabilitation. Cause if you get a player back to playing and that's why I hate the term return to play it is yeah. this adds like, look it the level that you coach at at the level that Ryan and I were coaching at and what we do in the private end with our own guys, we're not trying to get guys to play. We're trying to get guys to compete at the highest levels of the game and make millions and millions of dollars. We're not trying yeah. to go do weekend warrior stuff. We are creating athletes when it comes down to it. And we can't just silo it into going, well, we have to rehab him or we have to do performance. Why can't it be both? And why, and maybe I'm misinterpreting it, but why do other sports seem to do such a better job at understanding that than baseball? And soapbox. Oh give man, us some Let, context. I, I got to jump in here just before Chris does. Because, <laughs> you know, the, the, the first year, so the optics, even utilizing the word rehabilitation is, is not very helpful for athletes because there's a, there's a sense of brokenness, you know? And I, I talked to a, a guy who was in the AFL who was a, a return to performance strength, uh, strength coach, you know, and, and, and you know, I, I wanted to change the language, you know, it became return to performance. But now I'm like, I'm hearing Jordan speak and I'm hearing you, you speak. It's like, it, it's not just return to performance. It's like exceed performance, you know? And, and when I talked to this particular guy, Matt Pell, you know, he was telling me that the, uh, his, his return to performance programming was so much more intense than anything that they experienced in season, you know, and, and this is kind of like, this is a perfect bridge. Cause I was like thinking about how can I get this part of the conversation into this podcast? But the, we've talked about it. And I actually had Chris talk to uh, our team when I was with the angels about the role of maximum strength in the rehabilitation process, because a lot of what happens when the athletes get injured is the, the most uh, guiding principles in their process comes from uh, time and absence of pain. You know, generally what will happen, there'll be a medical plan that will be laid out. Um, the orthopedic surgeon will give a certain timeline. This is typically how long it takes for a rehabilitation program for an athlete. Um, and uh, they're looking for pain along the way. And somewhere it's lost in terms of force. You know, the, the message from us is like strength matters most. Strength is, is critical. Like you're and even saying. This is saying what drives it. me nuts. Just because someone's out of pain doesn't mean they're ready. Exactly. You and, know? And, to, and to me, this is, this is where I'm saying like. Shoot, strength, I've been out of pain for 12 years. I'm not yeah. ready to go compete. Strength, strength matters most. It does. It, even in the asymmetry um, example uh, that Chris gave is like that weaker limb is much more, um, is much more exposed to risk. And, and I know we talked about guys who are more, um, externally rotated in terms of strength. So they, they're more, uh, backside strong, but in pitching when they throw, and we, we don't capture this, but you can see it post game is that the internal rotators, and this is why we don't, we don't look at asymmetries after the games because the internal rotators, they actually weaken. You started putting some light bulbs in my head, man. The, the internal rotators, they weaken. It, it's been shown in a lot of research that the internal rotator cuff strength goes down. Now we have an epidemic of elbow injuries in baseball. And when people think they're, you know, it's, it's just common people out of baseball think even people in baseball, that the highest level of deceleration happens after ball release. But what they don't know is the highest eccentric forces torques for the shoulder. They happen in layback. If you look at a force time curve and you look at shoulder internal rotation torque, you'll see that the peaks of internal rotation torques is eccentric and it happens before maximal external rotation. It needs to be high to manage the layback of the arm because then it has to create, you know, a change in the direction to become concentric. And as the athletes accelerating their arm, the forces go down. So you think of fatigue, you know, you think of the, the, the risks that could be happening to the internal rotator cuff when you're throwing and and that's a weakness that's an asymmetry that's going on all the time you know that we're trying to to balance 
And I don't remember you know, what I asked you, Chris. Uh, it's uh, just, you know, you, you, I, I know I'm going off a tangent what? because I got excited, but we talked about we were on this topic. <laughs> You're saying maxim- you needed to rein me in. Ma- yeah. Intro, huh? <laughs> maximum <laughs> strength matters <laughs> in the rehabilitation process. So Chris, I'm going to turn it over to you. Cause uh, I mean, that, yeah, no, 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 who's the awesome. guest on this show, Ryan? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the grief man. Sorry. <laughs> Honestly, all jokes aside, this is without question the best podcast I've ever done. <laughs> awesome. Um, so I, I'll just I'll go back to something really quickly before I do the strength thing. Uh, go back to something you said, Ryan. It doesn't surprise me that the largest talks um, for the internal rotators are highest on their eccentric movement because you know conceptually think about the force production capability of a muscle and all group of muscles is always greater eccentrically than it is concentrically, isn't it? Yeah. You, know, you can super maximally load eccentrically, but you can't then concentrically lift 120% of your clean pull, or you can't then do 110% box squat concentrically. So it, it doesn't surprise me that when it's force or torque that's being measured eccentrically for the internal rotators, it happens in this position. Excuse me. Yeah. Total sense. Um, and then there was, I'm going to say there was like two other parts to the question, right? Which was multidisciplinary team focused. Yeah, that yeah. was one. Yeah. That's <laughs> the important one. Whatever Ryan yeah. said, that <laughs> yeah. Max and then one about Max String. Look, I think the MDT thing, um, I think that's so specific to each organization. I Honestly, Jordan, I think you're giving the UK way too much credit here. Uh, you know, there's plenty of organizations i know where people are working in silos the physios don't get on with the strength coaches and you know the technical coach and the head coach just couldn't care less what we do anyway you know and all that sort of stuff so um i i think it's getting better and i think um I have a really random reason why i think it might be getting a bit better i have two reasons actually one is because uh, in the uk whether it's right or not I think a lot of people look up to the English Institute of Sport, the EIS, as an organisation. EIS is the organisation that train all our Olympic athletes. So they're government funded. And every time Team GB goes to the Olympics or the world champs, it's EIS and their practitioners that are responsible for it. Right. Um, And there's a bit of a stigma, I guess, attached to the EIS as an organisation that in strength and conditioning, it's the pinnacle of where you can work at. I mean, it definitely don't pay the most, <laughs> you know, when you compare it to professional sport, but it's kind of seen that, you know, we're the EIS type thing. And there's a bit of a stigma attached to that. And I, what the EIS do very well is um, they work very cohesively in a multidisciplinary team. You've got the psychologist, the nutritionist, the strength coach, the physiotherapists, the technical coaches. And there's a bunch of random positions that most organizations around the world wouldn't have heard of you know like technical leads director of performance solutions all these fancy names you know that go on in in these institute type uh, organizations the institute is and you know uk england we're a very small nation so eis has quite a lot of strength coaches and support staff attached to it to look after our olympic athletes and because we're quite small everyone knows them And because there's a strong MDT link in an organization like that, um, and they do a lot of their own very solid internal research as well, I guess other organizations potentially might look up to them as a, almost like an operational model and think that's the way we should operate. So if you think the, um, your perspective or opinion of sports like rugby and cricket They don't operate in silos. They work well together. It's potentially, you know, because they look up to organizations like EIS and see this like, you know, perfect model that look after all our Olympic athletes. And that's how we want to operate. In reality, do all organizations operate like that? No, definitely not. (laughs) So it probably comes down to, you know, just, you know, ultimately with people, right? People working with people. Do you get on, if you don't get on with the people you work with, you're going to be working in silos, aren't you? Mm-hmm. Like that's how it works. Um, and, and I think that probably goes on. That's why I keep Ryan out of everything that I do. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, it was a, you know what? It's just, it's just saying this. 
that was one of my knocks. You know, this is what I heard about myself being in professional baseball is that I included too many people. It was very interesting. Um, some people would say, you know, I had too many people on the emails or the meetings. But for me, I think the collaborative sense, I, I, I wanted to have other people weigh in you know, even though I was able for strength and conditioning, sports science, I was able to make the decisions. Um, I wanted people from outside, you know, the, the front office members, the, the, uh, even the scouts that weren't involved in player development, uh, medical, you know, I had a lot of people involved because I, I, I wanted that. I, you know, what Jordan says, like, yeah. you know, a pitching coach, when it comes to a player is seeing them in such a different light than a strength coach. You know, and the information, different relationships, as different well, relationships you know? with the player. Exactly. Exactly. We found something out that was so impressive was that there was a report that the medical staff would put out called the, it was called the maintenance report. Nobody ever knew about this report in the entire organization. We just looked at the injury report. We were told players, you know, That's that like weren't, weren't able to go. A car accident happened. Well, exactly. Okay, well, how do we prevent the car <laughs> exactly. accident? Exactly. You know? And so we just know so, there's a car accident. Yeah. And so when this maintenance report came out, I, I know as soon as, as soon as I like, we need the maintenance report. And I could see the medical staff going, they're rolling their eyes. They're like, oh my God, do not ask us for the medical report because now they have to export the information. It's a little bit more complicated because it's not an injury. Um, and, and, but anytime that the athlete gets treatment, there was this running list of treatment and uh it was and, so effective. Here, here's the thing though because we talked about it we all talked about it I took, yeah. you know jordan's in and, on the meetings now now it's not like oh, okay so and so isn't in our practice plan today we don't have to worry about them we're going to readjust now it's like okay so and so has been getting like a lot of acupuncture he's getting a lot of soft tissue work his back's been bothering him and this kid's not said anything to anybody he's just you know gone in to get the treatment and then he's back <laughs> out. Now the coaches all understand. It's like, okay, I got to modify my training program. And the strength side of things is like no axial lifts. Like this is stuff, it was, un it was unreal. It should have been. Here, here's what drives me nuts with all this is we had a couple of weeks back. I don't even remember who we were talking to on it. We've had so many good conversations that had some great points come up. We we're talking about keeping an adjustment log. And yeah. if, if you expect a coach, especially at the professional level, to monitor whenever he implements something new, why wouldn't you expect that out of your athletic trainers? Or why wouldn't you expect that out of your strength coach? Or even your front office? Why wouldn't you expect that out of everyone who's involved in actually squeezing every last drop of development out of that player so you can understand, as is what I'm doing? And again, I don't necessarily use pain as the solution to right and wrong because I've known some guys that are just always in pain and the MRIs are fantastic. Their strength numbers are fantastic. They just have a low pain tolerance. I'm always saying, if you have pain, obviously make sure everything's good, but it doesn't always mean that something's wrong, if that makes sense, um, at the high levels. But we need to be aware, like if we're implementing something in a player that usually has a five out of 10 pain scale, we implement something, whether it's on the AT side or the strength side or the skill side, and now he's monitoring at a seven. Now we need to pay attention to what we just did. We might've made a really bad adjustment, even with good intentions. You know, and I think that's how we need to really monitor those things. And, you know, we're talking about, you know, the maintenance report and it's not anything to do with the question that we just asked. I no, know it's, it's collaborative. <laughs> but, I mean, you know, it's about collaboration and, and it's one of those things that it's like, I just think it's so important that people monitor where their athletes are at, whether you're working with a 10 year old or whether you're working with a guy who's in the big leagues or whatever the, yeah. the high end soccer league is. I know we have Real Salt Lake where I'm at. I don't even know if that's an actual major so – is it Major League Soccer? Is that what they call it? MLS. Yeah, it is. MLS. Yeah, it is MLS. So, They're MLS. So, you know, I know we have one of those here, and I don't know the way they monitor and do their adjustments or how those changes even occur, but it's just so important to understand, like, you know, if there is asymmetry, if there is lack of strength, and we're putting these things in, and now we're seeing an increase in pain. Or if we have a player who's normally at a 10 out of 10 pain with the way he's reporting it, and you can think of a specific left-hander that I'm talking about, Ryan, that if all of a sudden you take that guy who's always in pain regardless, and then you get him down to an 8 out of 10, maybe that's a positive adjustment. But you need to, you need to have all parties con continually totally. talking, interconnected, yeah. to do what's right for the athlete. Because when you, when you choose to become a coach, you choose to put your agenda to the side when it comes yeah. down to it because you're not the one yeah. going out between the lines it's not about well, you that that's i think that's the thing isn't it i was going to say i'm sure this comment would probably piss a load of people off but you that's know okay. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> if um, the people who, um, to use your example, Ryan, the people who are worried about you trying to collaborate or to kind of echo what you were saying, Jordan, the people who have a problem with something you said or a decision you make, uh, it, it's usually those people that either A, don't really have any value to add or anything useful to input or B, are so insecure, they're scared of losing their job. You know, yeah. so you have, to, you have to be able to see through people who deflect in a negative way that doesn't keep the athlete at the center of the equation. You know, because yeah. I think what you just said at the end there, Jordan, perfect, you know, which is if you're a coach, like I say this all the time in presentations and conversations, like we're support staff. It's not about us. It's yeah. never about us everything we do is athlete centered and if it's not <laughs> why isn't it it's not about you do you know what yep. i mean so um i think that's that's really really important really pertinent so uh yeah it totally resonates with some of the stuff that's happened over here with us as well um, i gotta i gotta hijack this again we gotta get to this max strength during during no worries. you gotta talk to me about you know the science and the things that you've been seeing you know as far as getting the athlete to a place that they are exceeding performance yeah, no problem. I, look, I think it's, um, I mean, it, this answer is super dependent on the nature and exact type of injury, right? Um, but, I mean, where this article came from, one of the articles we wrote on the relevance of maximal strength and rehabilitation, um, it, it was kind of spearheaded by one of our PhD students who's a physio. So it was coming from a really good place, right? It's a physiotherapist who mm -hmm. is the importance of strength because you don't need to convince a strength coach <laughs> yeah. important in rehabilitation do you like that's yeah. the last person you need to tell we're already there chomping at the bit trying to get <laughs> back in the trap bar and in the squat rack again um, yeah but i mean again just i think the best place to start on this is to step away from any specifics of research or injury type and just say that if an injury is severe enough to keep an athlete from training over any extended period of time, which might be two, three or four weeks, then from what we know about maintenance as a concept in the limited research that there is on this, it's highly probable that athletes are going to um, experience some reduction in strength right? or some reduction in force production capabilities. Mm -hmm. So it means that strength in some form or another it likely has to be a factor in the ongoing rehabilitation process, right? Because you can actually, we all know that you have to work really hard to improve uh, and to some degree maintain strength, but you can lose it very quickly. Everybody knows that, right? So I'm a good case study. All right. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> I've seen so it. <laughs> any, so any, um, any kind of extended period of time, like it, it, to me, you know, again, step away from research, just practically speaking, any extended period of time longer than really two or three weeks, there's going to be some reductions in force production capability, right? Um, and, and now, again, take our concept we were talking earlier about asymmetry and forget that we're talking about asymmetry. This isn't now right and left legs. Now we're just talking about pre-injury ceiling versus post-injury new ceiling of force production capability. You've just reduced your ceiling of force okay. production capability by virtue of not being able to train for three or four weeks and therefore losing some level of strength that might only be small but the concept of what we spoke about on limb imbalances is the same thing in this example which is if my ceiling of strength used to be here now my ceiling of strength is here my tolerance capacity is reduced and the same principle is now being applied and i guess to give you i think this is best kind of understood and i think everyone will understand that but it's almost expanded upon and echoed well with a couple of specific examples. So um, I've done one, uh, this is the one question I've come super prepared for baseball, by the way. One of my examples is to do with baseball. Um, nice. But the first, the first one's gonna be about an ACL, right? So for an ACL injury um, that happens in some sort of unexpected or unanticipated agility movement. And that's a really fair statement to make because if you look at some of the mechanisms of how ACL injuries occur in soccer and rugby. Um, a lot of the mechanisms, they come up with three really big key mechanisms in soccer and one in rugby from some of the limited research on this. And in rugby, 
the biggest uh, non-contact uh, mechanism was sidestep cutting, how ACL injuries occurred. And in football, one of the three that they came up with was to do with cutting and changing direction. So we know that um, when we need to retrain our athletes during what initially is likely to be uh, unanticipated change of direction task, because during rehabilitation, you're not just going to go straight into letting them train again. You're going to have to retrain um, planned change of direction mechanics before you get them back into unanticipated change of direction and agility work. We likely need to encourage our athletes to learn how to brake properly. You know, they're going to need to learn how to slow down and decelerate and load through that injured side with good technique again, because they've just gone through a huge traumatic injury. And if you consider the function of the ACL, right, which is to kind of stop the tibia from gliding forward relative to the femur, if, if you specifically understand what that function is, that gliding forward concept, well, quadricep strength is obviously going to be of paramount importance in the athlete having the confidence to break properly using that leg and loading through the knee again, because the quadricep strength is going to help prevent that anterior glide concept when they decelerate and break. And if they don't have the strength there, this is, remember there's a question obviously about maximal strength. If they don't have the strength in that leg, they're not going to be able to load properly. They're not going to be able to break as efficiently. Um, and ultimately that movement has to happen before they change direction. And remember in the rehabilitation journey, we're talking about them doing this in a planned movement. Are you, yeah. you and what's coming? I know what's coming. Imagine what now happens when it's unplanned. You know, why do we think re-ruptures of ACLs or on the contralateral side is so high? It's because people are not rehabilitated properly. Go to Tim Hewitt's research, who's like one of the world leading experts on ACLs. Like, People are not rehabilitated properly in ACLs. You know, he'll tell you actually that most people's test batteries are shit and they haven't got that right, you know, um, let alone the rehabilitation process is not good enough. And then I guess the second example, I think some of what we covered earlier actually is the pitcher. So your baseball pitcher has a shoulder injury to the rotator cuff group. Um, and this is kind of echo some of what we we're talking about earlier. You know, not only do we need to build strength in and around the shoulder again, but it's that concept that we were speaking about earlier, which is strength training the antagonist group, you know, your posterior delts, your rhomboids, your mid-lower traps, so that when they're trying to pitch the ball again at full speed, the antagonists have the strength to just basically let the shoulder let rip, you know, and go, you can just do your thing. You can accelerate as hard as you want. I will slow you down. The GTO is not going to go crazy and cause a problem. Don't worry, I've got this. That's essentially what we're saying. And the more force and the more strength that our muscles have, and again, in both examples there, ultimately you're just elevating your ceiling, you know? Um, and, and that will have implications as well. Remember, we're talking about what implications does maximal strength have in rehabilitation? But in rehabilitation for athletes in sport, everything in sport, happens in a finite period of time, doesn't it? Yeah. Everything happens like that. Rate of force development, you know, the time to produce force is tiny in comparison. So what implications does this have on things like RFD and power? Well, remember for power, power is force times velocity or strength times speed. So strength is a huge foundation, isn't it, for things like power and velocity-based movements. And equally, like, when we know that our athletes need to be strong and they need to be powerful, but they also need to be fast as well, because there's lots of physical capacities that our athletes need to be good at, because unless it's powerlifting, it's not just about strength, is it? Um, you know, then it's likely that a mixed methods approach is going to be really, really important for our athletes, isn't it? So yeah. they need to include max strength. They need to be training the velocity end of the force or load velocity curve where they focus on sprinting and plyometrics and then they're going to need to do some training in the middle aren't they like loaded exercises in the weight room as well such as jump squats and push press and that's how you shift the whole curve isn't it so that not only is maximum strength important but you get the knock-on effect in a positive way for you know velocity and power-based movements which is you know that's where your adaptation is for sport you know strength is your foundation so that your velocity and your power 
can improve in sport because you don't have the time in sport to access the time you need to develop maximal strength. Mm -hmm. So it's really about how quickly can you get a greater proportion of your maximal strength accessed when in sport you've only got 200 milliseconds to access force. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah. And you know, Ryan, you, you pointed out earlier my time with the NPA, uh, you failed to mention, uh, my time with what you've referred to as the Ivy league of the West coast at Vanguard university. Oh but we, we did a lot of stuff there as well. Vanguard um, university is a small school uh, at the NAIA level. So it's not a D one program. And right. there's a, there's an Ivy league in the, hey, how, many, how many big leaguers came out of your school, brother? Buffalo. Yeah. A couple. Tom yeah, Murphy. We got a, He's in there. We got uh, old tugboat himself, you know, pitched for the halos and we got Jose Rojas who yeah. hit for the angels. So, you know, we're pumping them out left, right. And we're just waiting for center, you know, but, uh, um, but anyways, uh, you know, during my time with the NPA, we, we would get a lot of those guys coming back after quote unquote rehab. And we saw the same thing. Like these guys are not rehabilitated. They're semi out of pain, but these guys, it's like the goal of a lot of rehab programs, not all of them, but a lot of them are, let's get this guy back to where he was right before he got injured. So it's like, let's get the brakes of the car just as bad before that terrible skid out happened. You know, it's like, that doesn't make any sense to me. So these guys would come in and we would set the foundation between plyometric work, between isometrics, we did a ton and a ton of eccentric. Cause for us, that's the foundation. Let's get your explosiveness working through the lower half. Let's set the foundation with stability and then let's make sure you can handle that deceleration with uh, eccentric work. And we would kind of go, what's your body weight? What do we think those minimums are? And let's add 20%. And then once we got to that, we knew that foundation was set. When we got into concentric and more explosive type movements, we were able to make that progress really quick. And then we could start getting into our, you know, speed training for it to where now we're going to take that powerful movement. And we're getting it to here. And now let's add some velocity to it, whether that from the pitching side was a weighted ball or whatever it may be to increase that arm speed. But we knew we set that foundation. So if this was the bare minimum we thought we needed, let's add to that. Because like you said earlier, two, three weeks, you're going to start losing those properties. So if we're going to lose those properties, we better not meet the baseline. We better exceed the baseline because we're playing 162 games I on wanted- hot dogs and jello, you know, so we have to be ready to go. I, w- I want to jump in here because I want to make it something easy for the listener. Uh, and I think, you know, Chris, this might resonate with you, but over my time in baseball, I kept looking at arm care programs. You know, it, it looked a lot like rehabilitation to me, the way athletes were trained, light cuff weights, dumbbells, not heavier than five pounds, you know, v- very light, light work. And, you know, the biomechanics of baseball. So when the arms laid back, your elbow takes the load of about 70 foot pounds of force. Okay. When, you know, you are releasing the ball, just post release the ball, the deceleration loads are over body weight. So you think about sticking someone's body, your own body on your fingertips, you know, and it's pulling your arm out of your socket. That's what you're trying to, you know, you're trying to manage, right. And you've got these five pound cuff weights and these three pound dumbbells, but I, you know, if you go back to evolution, we used to throw spears, you know, we used to throw spears. I think they to, still to do kill, that in some track contests. Well, to, yeah, to throw down. <laughs> I mean, to kill things, to, to eat, right? Throwing was a very essential part of survival in evolution. And, you know, when you think of spear, it was perfect. I was like, man, this, this, is, this is the model. Because, if you, you know, I, in taking the acronym spear, you know, strength, S, strength is, is the most important feature, just like what you're talking about. Then P is power right? We need power. Now E is endurance, but throwing, in my opinion, is the endurance exercise. What, what throwing athletes need is maximal strength and rate of torque development endurance. They need to be able to repeat these max uh, high speed applications of force, high forces. They need to be repeatable, right? Because think of the forces that are on the arm. And then A is the asymmetries. Now you have to think about the balances Because like what you're saying, this muscular imbalance goes on and off all the time throughout the season. So you need to figure out, like what you said, what's steady? What do we need to close the gap on? And then the last thing for me personally, which is completely opposite than a medical model, completely opposite is range of motion, is the R. I think that's kind of 
way at the end, you know, obviously if, if someone gets tacked down um, with, with uh, screws or um, they're, they're, you know, being surgically intervened that there's tightness, I mean, that's part of the process, but it, it, it becomes lower priority, you know, in, in terms of my opinion, in terms of strength, you know, the S is spear, it, it matters most, you know, in, in terms of my model. And I, I know we've, we've been on this quite a while, but I got to get to this too, because you're one of the foremost experts on lower, just lower body testing in general. Force plates in baseball are becoming a huge element of assessment for athletes. There's lots of studies, even myself, Louisiana Tech, um, where I'm a research associate, um, we're, we're studying a lot of jump uh, kinetics and characteristics um, and, and how it affects performance. But where, where are sport performance people going wrong with jump testing? Ooh, that's good. Yeah, listen, the first thing I've got to say is you need to copyright that spear concept. <laughs> I, uh, I love that. You need to you need to get that in a paper or something. Like, I don't know, man. It's just, it's just I, felt, I thought about it. It's just like, man, like it's the, the where did we start throwing? Yes, it was at the spear. And then I started write, thinking about it. Like, write it as a, like an editorial or something. I reckon the Twitter world <laughs> would go nuts for it. Um Okay, look, where, well, where are people going wrong in uh, evaluating jump testing? Okay, look, it, it's a tough one to answer. It's, it's probably quite context specific. Um, but uh, obviously, talking off air with you guys, um, just did a big uh, article on reactive strength index, right, in sports medicine, uh, which Ryan's read. And, yeah, and you, I, have to, you have to explain the reactive strength index because that's no be a new concept okay. for a lot of people. <laughs> No problem. Okay, so the reactive strength um, index is a metric that you can, or variable that you can gather from a jump test called a drop jump. Um, when an athlete, you know, steps, uh, sorry, stands on a box or a bench um, that's X centimeters high, they step off, they land on the ground, and their instructions are to jump as high as they can whilst minimizing the amount of time they spend on the floor once they step off the platform, okay? So they're doing a reactive vertical jump after they step off a platform or a box and they've got to jump as high as they can. They've got to get off the ground as quick as they can simultaneously. And reactive strength index is a number that you get when you take the jump height and you divide it by the ground contact time. Yep. Okay, so that's 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 a number that you get, and it gives you the higher the number, the higher the RSI, reactive strength index, the better your reactive strength ability. Okay, and reactive strength is kind of thought to be a a physical quality that's important for athletes because it's underpinned somewhat by strength, but it's underpinned also by your ability to produce force quickly, which, as we were talking about earlier, is really really important in sport. Um, I don't know if you guys or your listeners or any of you guys will know um, Sportsmith. Uh, it's a converted company by a guy called Rob Pacey. Does the Pacey performance? Oh, yeah. No, uh, yeah, yeah. I've listened to Pacey. Perfect. Performance by okay, guess. right. So, you know, Rob Pacey, he's just rebranded his company Sportsmith, right? Um, and I just wrote him an article for his website that he put up about two weeks ago. And it's about ratio data. And we were already kind of talking about that. But I think that's one of the things um, in jump testing where we could be better at, you know, like we just spoke about RSI. Um, the counter movement jump is a really, really, really common test, um, you know, in not just baseball, but probably most sports, to be honest, because it's simple to use. Athletes don't need loads and loads of teaching and skills to do it. And it gives you some understanding of, capacity and if you've got force plates hopefully you also monitor strategy how the jump was performed as well because yeah. the reason for the listeners the reason you might want to monitor jump strategy as well as the outcome so the outcome is how high you jump and jump strategy would be how you do the jump the reason you might want to monitor strategy metrics is because some research has shown that strategy metrics are more sensitive to change mm -hmm. um, when you're doing the ongoing monitoring process than the outcome measure. So to give you an example, athletes can be fatigued 
after competition, even days after competition, still achieve the same jump height, yep. but just manipulate their strategy to yep. achieve the same jump height, right? And I think one of the things that we could do better um, is to, if we select a metric that is a ratio, and it's really common in jump testing, RSI, uh, RSI mod, or yep. RSI modified for its full name, for those who don't know what that is, it's, um, it's the jump height divided by the time it takes to take off in a vertical yep. jump. That's RSI modified. Impulse, as I mentioned, yeah, yeah. with um, net force times time. Yeah. Okay. Um, RFD, for those who believe you should monitor RFD and jump testing. I don't, but some people do. Um, you know, that's like your change in force over your change in time. These yep. are all ratio numbers. And, and here's the thing, right? And this is what my article for Rob Pacey was about. When you track changes in metrics or performance tests over time, changes in ratios, and I know this is an answer specific to ratios, but the reason it's an answer specific to ratios is because ratios are so commonly used in jump testing. Yeah. So it's really relevant to lots of people. When you track changes in ratios over time, it's really, really hard to comprehend unless you monitor the component parts of the ratio. Yeah. So let me give you an example, right? Athletes will exhibit a range of different strategies to improve their performance. Now, RSI modified, to give you an example, is jump height divided by time to take off. You can have two RSI modified values that are exactly the same, but one athlete can jump much higher than the other, and the other athlete can just be much, much quicker off the floor, you know, in the time yeah. to time aspect. But if you only take the ratio number, the RSI modified value on its own, you miss the information that's underpinning it. Yeah. And that's really important, right? Because if you've got one athlete that jumps really, really high, he's got no problem with capacity but he might just be really, really slow at producing the force. <clears throat> and actually, if he plays in a sport where reactive force capabilities are important, then actually, if his time to take off is crap, and his RSI mod is only good because he's got a really powerful high jump, if from a programming perspective, maybe that tells us what we need is, you know, more kind of reactive plyometric type training. Mm -hmm for the athlete that doesn't jump as high but is super super quick off the floor he doesn't need the reactive concept because he moves nice and quickly he just needs to improve his capacity yep. so maybe you know strength is a larger focus on something like that um so i think it's about understanding those things and then i think there's one other thing we can do in jump testing <clears throat> i just wrote um i think i sent this to you a few days ago ryan i just wrote and published a jump framework article um, and it was all about um, offering practitioners a framework to guide which metrics you should select from the counter movement and drop jump tests. Um, and, and essentially, it was to help support, you know, decision making when we're using these tests in practice. And the framework kind of discusses three aspects to it, right? Number one is you need a biological basis for choosing a test, as well as doing a needs analysis for the sport and the athlete, right? And to give you an, ex an extreme example, if I train Usain Bolt, you know, like, why am I doing a jump test with Usain Bolt when I should just test him running? Because he's the fastest man on earth, right? My testing for Usain Bolt should be how fast he sprints, because he's the fastest man on earth. But actually, if you look at the correlation between how high a sprinter jumps and how fast they run, that R value is pretty strong. <clears throat> so my biological basis for choosing a counter movement jump with my athletes is because the relationships are quite strong and also, you know, the nervous system, you know, gets absolutely hammered in repeated sprint testing, but in jump testing, I can do that as part of the monitoring process at the end of the warm up before their session at the gym. Okay. So there's my biological basis, okay? Um, the second thing we speak about is feasibility of implementing this stuff, <clears throat> you know, so 
if I'm Joe Smith at a professional soccer club here in the UK, but we're in League Two and I'm a department of one, you know, you probably should be spending more time working directly with the athletes, building relationships and getting to know them rather than doing force plate testing, right? You probably stand to lose more than you gain mm-hmm. if you're on your own, but if you're a department of like 10 people and you've got the resources to actually implement change, yeah, maybe this is useful for you. And the third part, which is maybe the bit that we can do better on, um, I'm basing this off a lot of conversations I've had in the past few years <clears throat> in professional sport, is this concept of sensitivity to change. (coughs) Excuse me. So this is basically determining whether change is real or not in the continued monitoring process. You know, like athlete jumps 40 centimetres. Oh, great, they jump 42 centimetres, you know. But if that change is not larger than the error or the variability in the test, it's not real. Mm -hmm. You know, there's measurement error in everything Mm -hmm. that we as practitioners, as athletes, and the equipment, the environment, etc. So I think the key thing that um, we found in the last couple of years, and it was a big part of why I wrote that Jump Framework article, is that people are not always aware, um, or they just don't want to <laughs> um, establish whether change in the monitoring process is real. And I can talk a little bit if you want me to about how that's done, but the relevance really is um, if a metric is not sensitive to change, you know, like it's not informing you anything. There's no data to guide your decision making or help inform any decision that's being made. So why are you continuing to monitor it? You know, I, I get data sets sent to me all the time, literally all the time by professional sports teams over here. Like, can you help us with the asymmetry of this? Like, how how do we interpret this? And, you know, I see repeated data sets where it's the same test battery over and over again. And when I just run simple stuff, like I'll just put the means and the standard deviations in my effect size spreadsheet, or I'll just calculate the coefficient of variation for them and look at the percentage change relative to the coefficient of variation on an individual level. Yeah. you don't see any true change i'm like why are you still running this test it's not telling you anything you know you know that is to me that's the process of applied sports science you know and we're only talking about jump testing is one example here you know like this jump framework paper when here's an example of different metrics you could select from the counter movement and drop jump tests but really what i missed out in that paper is you should be applying that in practice and after you've got it two or three times if one or two of those metrics are not sensitive to change you should get rid of them replace them with new metrics and the process of applying sports science is it should take you a season or a couple of years to figure out which metrics you should be monitoring which actually inform your practice and that's that science it changes it evolves you know um and i think that's the part that people are not always doing Great, you know, um, and if you want me to talk about the specifics of how you track change, I can, but I don't know whether that's right for your listeners. No, I think that's intense. I, I kind of wanted to, you know, wrap this up. That might be up. podcast number two. Yeah, we need, we need to have right. one. But just, just so I'm aware before we, we end the podcast, for people to determine whether the measurement actually matters and, it can, and, and the change is real, they're looking for the degree of change in the metric and they're, you're comparing it to the coefficient of variation, so how variable it is. So if the coefficient of variation is greater than the actual change, that means the change is not that meaningful. Am I correct in that thinking? Yeah, perfect, perfect. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a number of different ways of doing it. There's a number of different ways, right? You can, you can test it through. Um, if you're testing it on a group level for your group of athletes, it would be yeah. different than if you were testing it individually. But I guess, truthfully, you know, when you work with a squad of athletes, you know, the challenge is trying to individualize everything, you know, in a squad. So we're always at some point going to be looking at the data individually, aren't we? Even when we're working with a large squad like baseball or soccer or something like that. So, yeah, you do three, five trials of a test or a metric. You calculate the coefficient of variation for that given number. Okay, you do that each time. 
And then when you have, let's say, for example, my coefficient of variation is 3% for jump height, okay, that I recorded in test session one. And after my training intervention, I go and measure jump height again, and it's now 44 centimeters. I've had a four centimeter change. Yeah. And that you can calculate that as a percentage, which is 10%. Okay. Relative to 40, 10% is much greater than my 3% coefficient of variation. That is yeah. now a true change nice. right, performance. And I think that's something, I mean, this is stuff you can just automate and set up in your spreadsheet. Yeah even gathered you know it's so easy to do and it just spits out the information for you as soon as it's done um and i i hope i'm not over you know stating um something but we're talking about tracking percentage change like we, we learned how to do that in math class when we were 11 right so yeah. no it, it's not hard really yeah this is awesome well listen chris i mean this has been amazing um i truly am grateful that you made the time for our uh, our podcast um, for the listeners that are out there, how, how do they get in contact with you? What's the best way to connect with you if they have questions? Yeah, no problem. So uh, anyone can feel free to email me. So my email is c.bishop at uh, mdx for Middlesex, mdx.ac.uk. Okay, that's my email where you can just uh search me up on twitter or linkedin if you want to um i'm not one of those people that ignores messages ryan can vouch for me for that yeah. so feel free to reach out and uh, i will reply well uh this has been an unbelievable podcast i hope the listeners take a lot from it i know i have and uh we're going to continue to have conversations if uh, anybody has questions about the podcast and they want to reach out to us please do at support at armcare.com and until next time, make sure you get listening. subscribed as well. You know, oh, yeah, a subscribe. Button. That's right. Subscribe. The hit, that's a, hit the subscribe button and, and like us. That's a and good like one. Like it too. while you're at it, you know? Yeah. Why not? Yeah. <laughs> I've seen some of the stuff people are liking this day and age. We're worth it. Yeah, we're worth it. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, guys. Thanks very much.